Amen. Well, aren't you glad that he is the glory and the lifter of our head this morning? Thank God for that song. Thank God for that psalm in chapter number 3 of the book of Psalms. And that is where I want you to turn this morning. I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Psalms. And I want you to find the third psalm. And I want to preach this morning a sermon that I've just entitled uh, what I believe David might would have titled it. And that is this, Thou, O Lord. Change it or come up with something more clever. I just want to preach this morning on this thought from Psalm chapter number 3, Thou, O Lord. We are in a time that I think most of you would agree with. It's, it's really un, unprecedented in, in, as far as anything that we uh, have experienced in our lifetime. And uh, when we go into areas where we experience things that we've never experienced, it creates a sense of uneasiness and anxiety and fear. In my own life this week, I uh, experienced, I mean, I'm telling you, apart from maybe the day that I was saved, I experienced this week one of the greatest joys in my life that I've ever experienced when I was able to, for the first time, hold my 7-pound, 14-ounce baby boy who was born this week. I mean, the joy was uncontainable in my heart. But do you know something? Not long after, several hours after, I began to see that joy be replaced with fear. I jokingly told my wife, I said, he's never playing baseball, he might get hit in the head. I said, he's never driving, he might get in a wreck. I said, in fact, I think we'll just wrap him in bubble wrap and we won't ever let him leave the house again. We'll just keep him right here with us so that nothing can happen to him. I feel as his dad that it is my job to be his protector. And the reality is this. He's going to live his life. He's going to do things. And I cannot be with him everywhere that he goes at all times. But listen to this. You and I have a father. And he is in heaven. And he is able to go with us wherever we go. In whatever we experience. In whatever trials and valleys and tribulations that we may face. Our God is able to sustain us, to defend us, to protect us, to give us whatever we stand in need of. In fact, the psalmist David worded it this way. He said, when my mother and my father forsake me, the two people who in this life should take care of me above all else, David said, when my mother and my father forsake me, he said, the Lord will take care of me. So we're in these unprecedented times. I mean, what do we do? Do we resort to fear? Do we resort to anxiety, depression? Do we live in the midst of uncertainty? Certainly we practice wisdom. I believe we ought to do what the government says. In this instance, I believe they're giving us good wisdom. They're giving us good advice. And I want us to, uh, to obey that. But what do we do in uncertainty? Well, I want to tell you about David's uncertainty in his life and the background for why he wrote this psalm. There were a lot of worship songs in Israel. Uh, we sing songs today. We think of uh, Amazing Grace, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, Just As I Am, all those famous songs that uh, we sing today that are, are such, uh, so dear to our hearts. And in Israel, they, they had those same kind of songs, but they were more than just worship songs. They were actually songs that told the stories of the Israelites. Many of these psalms were written by the great songwriter David, who was the king of Israel. In fact, of the first 41 psalms that you encounter in this huge book, the first 41, only three of them are not penned by David. Only three. Matter of fact, you might would say he was the Charles Wesley of Israel. Great songwriter. And the psalms that were written by David were filled particularly with an emotional aspect that is unique to the writings of the psalms. Oftentimes, David would write psalms in, in the middle of a difficult situation that he was facing, such as he wrote a psalm during his time with uh, the situation with Bathsheba, the affair that he had. He wrote a psalm concerning his encounter with the prophet Nathan when Nathan came to him and told him a story about the reality and the seriousness of David's sin. David examined his life as an old man, and he wrote a psalm that says this. I bet you know this one. He said, I, I, I've kind of looked back over the course of my life, and the conclusion that I've come to is this. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. David said in one point, he was an old man in Psalm 37. He said, I have been young, 
Now I'm old. And this is what David said. He said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. And so David would write these psalms in the situations of his life. It's exactly the case with this third psalm that we encounter today with David. He's in great distress. He's been driven out of his palace and out of the holy city by his rebellious son whose name is Absalom. In fact, you can find all this in 2 Samuel 15 through 18. And if you were here a couple of weeks ago, the last time we met, you remember that I preached on a man by the name of Shimei who criticized and accused David. That is happening during this time of his life. David's son Absalom had plotted to overthrow his father and the king of Israel. What happens is Absalom's rebellion puts David on the run from his own son, who happens at this time to be his greatest enemy. Everybody's standing around David. They say, David, I mean, what do you think about this? Your son, your own son has rebelled against you and has caused you to be run out of your own palace, your own hometown, your own country. David said, the Lord is my protector. He's a shield for me. Charles Spurgeon said it this way. The Lord rules the angels, the stars, the elements, and all the hosts of heaven. And the heaven of heavens is under his sway. The Lord is on our side, our ally. Woe unto those who fight against him. For they shall flee like smoke before the wind when he gives the word to scatter them. Can I just say something to you this morning as you're sitting there in the quiet of your home, own home? Let me just say what the Bible said. If God is for us, then who can be against us? Jesus said it this way to the disciples. He said, if in this world be sure that you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Let's read this psalm together in... Uh, Chapter number 3, and let's begin reading in verse number 1. David said, Lord, how they have increased who have troubled me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there's no help for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the lifter of my head. David said, I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. Selah. It's a musical notation. It's a writer's uh, indication. Just, Just stop and think about that. You know what David's wanting to tell you right there? Listen to what I just said, the psalmist David says. He heard me from his holy hill. Verse 5, David says, I lay down and slept, and I woke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people, Selah. Father, we ask you this morning that you would preach and speak through me during this time. Lord, these are unusual circumstances. And unusual times, but the word is still powerful. Lord, I still believe your promise that you said if your word return, goes out and is scattered, it will not return void. So I pray now, Father, during this time, you would help me to preach with clarity, with conviction, with anointing. And God, I pray that you'd give me unction. I pray now, Father, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, my strength and my redeemer. I ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody at home said with me, Amen. I want you to uh, look at this passage with me this morning. I want you to notice three things that I want to pull out of uh, these verses here in Psalm chapter number 3. Notice with me first, and if you're at home, I'd encourage you to take notes just like you would if you're in here. Just write a couple of things down with me. Number one in verses 1 and 2, I want you to notice in this psalm there is a stinging harassment. There's a stinging harassment. There is this harassment that comes to David verbally from his enemies. The harassment was bad enough on David in general, but the fact that it came from his own offspring made this situation even worse. And here's what David says to the Lord in verse number 1. He says, Lord, my enemies, they're increasing. They're not getting smaller in number. They're getting greater in 
number. 2 Samuel 15, 13. I remember I told you that's where we can find a lot of the history that's going on in this time. The Bible says a messenger came to David saying, The hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. David must have looked at the messenger and he said, Are you kidding me? You're telling me that all these men who used to be for me and they fought with me and they served with me, that now their hearts have gone after Absalom? The messenger said, David, it's true. David must have thought, My goodness, what a bunch of bandwagoners. They just jump on whatever the latest fad is. They've turned their back on me. David is, I believe, genuinely surprised that the people have turned on him in such a way as they have. It seems by the hour people are leaving the camp of David and they're joining with his son Absalom. In fact, David words it this way, many are rising up against me which means that they have turned not to secretly change sides, but they have turned in open rebellion against David. And it's caused him to have to go on the run. Let me tell you why this particularly stung David. Stung David because he knew exactly why it was happening in his life. It was happening to David because of his own sin. See, here's the reality of the message of the gospel. We can be forgiven of all sins, but there is still consequence. There is still uh, a payment that that we have to give in this life sometimes that causes us deep hurt. And and God had forgiven David of his sin, but, but there were still just situations around David that were coming into his life because of things that he had done. 2 Samuel 12, 11 said, Thus says the Lord, He says this through the prophet of Nathan, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. So it's more than just a rebellion in the family. It's actually the fulfillment of prophecy. Verse 2, they took their accusation a step further against David. They began talking about David's soul. See, in Jewish culture, the soul was man's chief part. It was the most important part of him. When you talk about the soul, it's very serious. They began talking about David's soul and they said of his soul, there is no help for him in God. A lot of people say that the church is losing in this time because we're having to cancel service. Let me tell you something, I believe the church is winning. I believe last Sunday morning more people heard the gospel at 11 o'clock because of so many different churches live streaming that I believe the gospel went out more last Sunday morning than it probably has in a very, very long time. And I know a lot of people watched last Sunday morning that may not normally watch and go to church. And I would venture to say there's a lot of people that are watching today that may not normally watch. And if you're watching here today and you think what David, what they said about David, you say of your own self that there's no help for me in God. God can't help me. There is no solution for the problems that I'm facing. I want to tell you something, and and I don't want to be over-spiritual here, but I want to tell you straight up, that's a lie from the devil. That's a lie from the pits of hell. There is help for you, and it's found in God. They began saying of David, there's no help for him in God. This is the strongest slam they could have used against David. The word help in the Hebrew is translated to mean salvation, deliverance, or rescue. Do you hear that? David, there's no salvation for you in God. David, there's no deliverance for you in God. David, there is no rescue for you in God. All of these people believe that. Absalom has deceived the people greatly. He's convinced them that God has removed himself from David. He will not come to David's aid, Absalom said. One can clearly see how these people would have believed such a lie. They see David out in the wilderness running from his son and they say to themselves, well, you know, God was on David's side. Why wouldn't he just smack Absalom down? I said something the other day to someone, I want to say this to you as you're listening at home. Sometimes God, sometimes God takes us through storms I believe God is taking us as a world and as a nation through a storm right now. See, I I, I may be accused of being super spiritual and and, and hyper spiritual when I say this, but I really believe that nothing in the world happens 
that catches God by surprise, that is not either ordained by God or allowed by God to teach us some lesson. And, and the fact that a virus has infected nearly the entire world has not taken God by surprise. And I believe that God wants to teach us something through this, and I want to say something to you until we learn what God is teaching us. We will not be removed from this storm. God was teaching David something in his storm, in his valley. While he was running for his life with very few people following him, his son Absalom says, Look, this king is running scared for his life. God's abandoned him. He will not rescue King David. Can I say something to you this morning? How wrong Absalom was in his diagnosis of the situation. Someone said, the child of God must not think it strange when he encounters enemies and when the streams and the tides are against him. Even Jesus had a few enemies screaming, crucify him, crucify him. But let me flip over now and give you the other side of it. Yes, there's a stinging harassment, but I, I want to tell you in verses 3, 4, 5, and 6 about a sustaining hand. Not only was there a stinging harassment from David's enemies, but he acknowledged also that there was a sustaining hand of God. See, David does not for a moment allow the harassment of those that are against him to either affect him or change who he is in God. In fact, what is it that David takes comfort in in this moment? What is it that David turns to and leans on in this moment of trouble and trial and tribulation? Let me ask you, believer, what is it that you take solace in in this moment of life that we find ourselves in? When we're fighting an invisible enemy, we can't point a gun at it. We can't fight a war against it. There's no solution. In fact, we don't know hardly anything about it, and we're scared. We're gripped by fear. What is it we turn to in these moments of our lives? Now it's a virus in six months. It may be a marriage that you're having that's on the rocks. It may be kids that you don't know what to do with. It may be a financial situation that you cannot come to grips with. There's all kind of things that we face in this life. And I want to ask you very clearly this morning, when you get your back against the wall, who or what do you turn to? I want to tell you who David turned to. David does not for a moment allow this harassment to affect him, but he takes comfort in one thing and one thing alone, and that is the character of God. You say, preacher, what do you mean by the character of God? Why does he take solace in the character of God? Look at what he says, but thou, O Lord. Where does his comfort come from? From the Lord. But why? Give me some more there, David. Give me something that I can base this on. David received three things from his confidence in God's character. He received, number one, safety. Number two, splendor. And number three, satisfaction. Let me give them to you real quick. Number one, he received safety. You say, preacher, where do you get that from? David said, thou, Lord, art a shield for me. What does that mean, a shield? It is the safety of God's defense. And David said, God's not just a shield, but he's a shield for me. See, actually when you translate that in the Hebrew there, David is literally saying, Lord, you are a shield about me. And the idea there is that God is not just a shield in front of him, but he's a shield behind him, he's a shield beside him, he's a shield all around him, and the enemy can come at him from behind, from the side, from this side, or from the front, but God is protecting him all the way around. The old-time preacher used to say this, we want to pray a hedge of protection around him. And David had one. Because God was a shield for him. David was a man of war. He was all too familiar with the importance of being protected on every side from the attacks of the enemy. And David knew that as long as he had God's protection, he was okay. But then look at what he says next. Not only are you a shield for me, but you're my glory. My glory. David said that God was his glory. He received the splendor that was associated with God's character. See, David realized that glory was not found in the crown that he had upon his head. 
His glory wasn't in a throne that he had once occupied back in Jerusalem. His, his glory was not in a position or a title that he held when he walked around and told people that he was the king of Israel. But his glory was in God. See, there's no possible way that the believer can ever be fully aware of the splendor of God until he removes his trust from everything else in this world and places it solely on his maker. Songwriter said it this way, On Christ the solid rock I stand and all other ground is sinking sand. I tell you what this time is teaching us in America. It's teaching us that all other ground is sinking sand. Every bit of it. If you thought your hope was in the stock market, you're in a mess now. If you thought your hope was in a robust economy, you're in a mess now. If you thought your safety and your security was in gathering together just at 1045 on Sunday morning, you're in a mess now. But I want to tell you something. If you realize that it's God who is the glory, and it's God who is the splendor, and it's God who is the satisfaction that you need in your life, then you're going to ride out this storm. You're going to be all right. You're going to come out on the other side okay. David said, not only was God the splendor, but he was my satisfaction. David said, he's the lifter of my head. David received the satisfaction of knowing that in due time, God would put him back where he was supposed to be. David knew that in the time that was appropriate, God would restore him back to his place, to his title, to his kingship, to his throne, to his palace. And so David said, Lord, you're the lifter of my head. Think about that. When we get sad, when we get depressed, we get anxious, we worry, we get consumed by fear. What, what do we do? We, we drop our head. When we are sad and we're overwhelmed, it just seems natural for us to walk around. Somebody might say you just mope and moan, but... When we're filled with joy, we lift our heads. When we come into the house of worship and we sing songs to the Lord, we lift our heads and we, we sing upward to Him and we lift praises. Everything in us is thrown up when we have hope. David said, He's the lifter of my head. And in that truth, David found great satisfaction. David affirmed this satisfaction in verse 4 when he said, I cried to the Lord with my voice. And he heard me from his holy hill. David said, I cried to the Lord. Amazing, right? I mean, how many times do you ever stand in awe of the fact that you have the privilege to cry out to the Lord? You have the right, as a child of God, to bring your petitions, your requests, and Paul says, to make them known to God. I want to tell you something this morning, and I don't want you to take this the wrong way. And, and there's many people who may be listening, and some of you may come from a Catholic background, and this is a no, I don't want to attack your faith, but I just want to tell you the truth, what the Bible teaches. This week I read an article that the Pope in Rome said that during this time of catastrophe, that Catholics all of the wor over the world are now able to, to take their request directly to God in confession. And that while we're in this time of quarantine and social distancing and self-isolation, that you don't have to go to a priest and confess. You can take them straight to God. Well, I want to tell you something, dear friends. The Pope is about 2,000 years late. Jesus Christ hung on a cross, and while he was there, the veil was rent in two from top to bottom. And when that veil was rent, God gave you the privilege and the access and the right to come into the Holy of Holies where he resides and bring your request directly to him. That's always been true. You've always been able to bring your request to God as a child who belongs to him. David said, I cried unto the Lord. But here's what David said. That's not even the most amazing part. The most amazing part of this is that I cried unto the Lord and He heard me. See, it's not amazing as much that you can cry out to God, but what is totally amazing and what just blows my mind is that when I cry out to God, He hears me. 
Oh man, the other night, I'm telling you, I was laying in my bed, and, and the little baby Judah was laying in the other room, and he began to cry out. And you know what I did? I knew my wife was in there with him, but man, I had to get up. I had to go see what he was crying about. I had, I had to see what was wrong with him. I had to see what his mama was doing to him to make him cry. Was she pinching him? Was she being mean to him? And I thought to myself, and, and this is the truth of the matter, I could never love him like God loves me. And how God must be moved by his children when they cry out to him. See, the Bible says to us, you as, as humans, you know, how to good give, you know how to give good gifts to your children. Just imagine how much more your Father in heaven is, is willing to give you good gifts. Because of his great love wherewith he loves you. David said, the Lord heard me out of his holy hill. You know what the holy hill is? It's, it's the residence of God. The Lord da answered David out of his temple where he abides. See, no matter what happens here in this life, I want to tell you something, God's always above it. That's why I love what... What Spurgeon said, he said, things out of our hands are still under his feet. You know why we pray in the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We say, Our Father who art in heaven, not because God needs to be reminded of where he's at, but to remind us that God is still in heaven and he's still on his throne. He answered me out of his holy hill. I love verse 5. David says, I was so confident was so sure of God's protection and provision. I love this. David said, I laid down and slept. Somebody said, David, you can't sleep. Absalom may be sending men after you. Absalom may be sending those guys who used to be on your side to come and, and take you out. You better not be sleeping. David said, hey. I cried to the Lord and he heard me out of his holy hill and I was so sure and confident that God was exactly what I needed. He was my shield, my strength, my glory, the lifter of my head. David said, I laid down and went to sleep. I laid down as if everything was fine. David had no reason to get worked up by his enemies because he knew who was in his corner. I'm not telling you to go out and Hug everybody and shake everybody's hands and kiss everybody and pretend like there's not the reality of the situation here today that we're facing, that we have a virus that's infecting us. And not just a virus, we have all kinds of things. See, here's the, here's the thing about it. I've realized this. Yeah, we have this virus going on all around us, but all of these other problems don't stop. See, we're all still facing the same issues in life that we were facing before this happened. We've just added something else onto it. But I want to tell you something. We need to be wise, and we need to have wisdom, and we need to do what is appropriate. But I want to tell you something else we don't need to do. We don't need to run around here like chickens with our heads cut off, wondering how we're going to make it and how we're going to come out of this thing, because that is a lack of faith in God, and that is us living outside of the reality that He's still on our side and He is still in our corner. So David didn't get worked up. He laid down, he went to sleep. And David said, I awoke. For the Lord sustained me. He continued on the same sleep schedule. He continued on the same morning schedule. He continued with the same way of living. Let me ask you something. Still reading your Bible every day? Still doing your soaps every day if you do those? Still getting in God's Word every day? Still going through our Bible reading plan as a church? See, yes, we're not gathering like we normally do, but God's still God, and we're still His children. And I love what Brother Bill Heaton used to say. He said, orders remain the same. Nothing has changed. God still expects the same thing from us that He always has. That we would love Him, that we would seek Him, that we would serve Him and honor Him in everything that we do. And I want to tell you something, believer. You've got a world full of people who have perked up. I'm going to tell you something. One thing that gets the world's attention is when uncertainty hits. And I want to tell you something. Now's the time to call that person that the Lord's been laying on your heart that you know is lost and to talk to them a little bit. Because there are a lot of people in this world who have 
woken up. And they begin to realize that, you know what? There are things that are out of our control. And they're seeking someone who has greater power than what can be offered in this world. Orders remain the same. There was a sustaining hand. But then thirdly this morning, and I'll be done, there was a sure heart. There was a sure heart. Not only did David face a stinging harassment, not only did David face a sustaining hand, but he also had a sure heart. He knew that God would take care of him. Hey, you remember what I preached last Sunday morning? Consider the birds, consider the lilies. God will take care of you. We've got to keep moving on. I-, I wanted this morning to be so normal for us that I've even worked up a sweat up here preaching just like I normally do. I wanted to be so normal that we decided to start five minutes late this morning, just like we always do here. God is still God. He's still that sustaining hand. And so we as believers ought to be equipped with a sure heart. David writes, verse 7. It's very interesting what he says. He says, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. You see what David does there? He writes it in the past tense. Somebody would say, David, verse 7 seems like something that maybe is a little more appropriate for you to say after we get back to Jerusalem, after we get back on the throne after everything kind of settles back to normal, then let's talk about how God struck all of our enemies in the cheekbone, how God's come at him with the left hook, and how he's broken the teeth of those who were ungodly and those who were against us. David, maybe that is something that we ought to say a little later. Getting a little ahead of yourself. David said, I'm not ahead of myself. David said, my surety is not in my own ability. My surety is not in the bodyguards who are around me. My surety is in my Lord. And I already know that what he said he would do, he will do. So I'm going to speak of it if it's already been done. What do you think about the promises of God? You think Romans 8, 28 is really true? All things work together for good of them who love God and are called according to his purpose. you really believe that God is able? Because when you know that God is able, you need not worry about anything else, about any other enemy. David writes, verse 7, as if it has already happened. Many writers, many Bible scholars call this the prophetic present. We're writing it in the past tense even though it has not happened yet because we're so sure that it will happen because of the one who has made the promise. David knew the faithfulness of God. He knew the strength of God. He wrote of the future destruction of his enemies as if it had already happened. David called them vicious lions who were ready to tear out his flesh. God, according to David, destroyed their cheekbones, took away their ability to bite. They couldn't grab down. Took away their teeth. They weren't able to inflict any pain or to exact any flesh. See, God defangs our enemies, renders them unable to attack us, takes away the power and the ability of them to harm us. David says in verse 8, Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Give you a modern translation of verse 8. We sing the old song. David says, Where in the world could I go but to the Lord? You say, preacher, so you think that, uh, that if we'll just pray enough that, that God will stop this virus? He may. He may. He can. He's able. 
And I'll tell you about a greater enemy that God's already defined. See, the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And the coronavirus and cancer, heart attacks and strokes and tragedies can end our lives here on earth. Can cause us to cease to exist in this world. But you know what the Bible tells us? Don't be afraid of the one who can destroy the body. Be afraid of the one who can destroy both body, soul, spirit. And you know, you had an enemy. The Bible says he was cast out of heaven before the worlds were ever created because he desired not only to be like God, but he desired to be God. We call him Satan. And I want to tell you something. You can think he's a fa fairy tale or fanciful, but he's real. And Satan came into the garden one day, and Adam and Eve were there in the garden, and Eve alone was there at the tree, and he encouraged and enticed her to eat. Has God really said? He asked her. God's just afraid, Eve, that in the day that you do eat, that you'll become like him, knowing good and evil. When she ate and she enticed Adam to eat, that's exactly what happened. They began to know good and evil. And into this world was introduced sin, and sickness, and viruses. If you look up to heaven and you say, God, why have you allowed this to happen on this earth? I want you to remind yourself that God did not author sin. Sin was introduced because of the disobedience of God's created beings. And every type of sin that has come after that, whether it's a virus or a sickness or any kind of evil that takes place in the world, it happens because men have rebelled against God in their hearts. And the devil walked out of Eden that day when he caused Eve to eat. And he's been trying to deceive every single human ever since then who turned their backs against God and to hurt, turn their hearts from God in rebellion. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this world. He was born as a little bitty baby, born to a virgin woman, conceived by the Holy Spirit, lived a perfect life, totally sinless. He was so perfect and so sinless and so in tune with God that the Pharisees hated him. The high priest hated him. The Romans were uneasy around him. And even the disciples weren't exactly sure what to make of him. Caused him to be crucified. All in the perfect plan of God. He was nailed to a cross. At the cross, he paid the debt that not he owed, but that we owed for all the sins that we would commit, that separated us from God. Jesus Christ went to the cross and He paid our debt on our behalf. He said, Father, I'll take the punishment for all of their sins and I'll, I'll carry that punishment on myself. It was not so much the whips or the nails or the crown of thorns, but it was the separation that He experienced from God. Jesus hung there on our behalf. He died. They took him down. They laid him in a borrowed tomb. He was graveyard dead. You know how a bee stings you? We always were told what? That a bee stings once. Stings you. Leaves its stinger inside of your skin. My father-in-law and I were talking recently about how people always would take a little tobacco juice and stick it on there and said it'd take the pain away and pull the stinger out. That bee would sting you and fly away never to sting again. And death came to Jesus there at the cross of Calvary and metaphorically it stuck its stinger in him. And when it flew away it could never sting again because Jesus had taken away its power. Jesus had defanged just like David said in Psalm 3, this enemy that we faced. 
And on the third day, Jesus did what nobody else has ever, could ever, or will ever do. He, in his own power. You say, what about Lazarus? Lazarus got up because Jesus told him to get up. Jesus got up because he wanted to get up. He self-resurrected. He got up on that first Sunday morning that we're about to celebrate here in just a couple of weeks. And he was made alive, according to Acts chapter 1, by many infallible, undeniable proofs. He stayed with the disciples for 40 days. He ascended up into heaven. He now sits at the right hand of God the Father, and he makes intercession for us. You say, what does that mean? It means he's our go-between. He speaks to the Father on our behalf. And anyone who believes and calls upon the name of the Lord can and will and shall be saved. They'll come to Jesus with a repentant heart, ask Him to forgive them of their sins, Submit their lives under His Lordship and say, Lord, it is no longer about how I want to live my life, but it is about how you want to live my life through me in your power. If we do that, Jesus Christ defangs the greatest enemy that we face. See, I'm not scared of a virus. I'm not scared of a sickness. I'm young, I'd like to live a long, long time, just natural. Got a lot I want to do here on earth, but I'm not afraid to die because I have already been promised what's going to happen. Be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord. What does terrify me is the thought of standing before God, not having made preparations for the judgment that waits there. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God, Hebrews 10. And I, in my own life, I made those preparations. Years ago, July 14, 1999, I knelt in my parents' bedroom, and I said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Save me. Live your life through me. Ever since that day, God's been faithful to do exactly what he told me he'd do. Paul told Timothy, he said, I'm confident that God who began a good work in you will complete it to the day of redemption. God's still working on me. I'm not perfect. But he's going to get me like he wants me before he takes me out of here. And I'm going to stand before him. And I'm not going to have a defense of, well, Lord, I was a good person. Well, Lord, I, I tried to preach a lot and do good by other people. No, none of those things are going to work. My defense and my hope is going to be, God, my only plea... My only defense is that Jesus Christ died for me, paid my sin debt, and I've trusted and believed in Him, and I have put all of my eggs in His basket. And Lord, the only defense I have is the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross. So let's not be scared of that which can harm our body. But let's make preparations to stand before the one who determines the eternal destiny of our soul. That is the most important thing we could ever do in this life. I want to ask David to come. He's going to play a song. We're going to sing. I'm going to do exactly what I did last Sunday morning. I want you to bow your head with me. I'm going to pray for us in just a moment. Hey, you don't have to be in a church to be saved. You don't have to be in a congregation of believers on Sunday morning to be saved. God is everywhere and in all places, and He's able to do abundantly above and beyond what we think or ask. So I'm just crazy enough to believe that God's powerful enough to save you right there if you don't know Him and you desire to be saved. Maybe you're there today and you say, Preacher, I know I'm saved, but I've been living just in total fear. Not, not just about a virus, but God, just in other areas of my life. I, I've totally been living without faith. Ask the Lord today to forgive you of that. And help Him to give you that sure heart that I preached about today when I talked about David. Maybe you're here and you're listening this morning by live stream and you say, Blake, I am lost. I don't know that if I stood before the Lord that I would have the defense that you talked about. Would you bow your head with me? If you really feel the Lord drawing you to salvation, you say, that is, that's what I need. I need to be saved. I'm going to pray a prayer, and there's no power in words. 
of our mouth. It is about what is taking place in the reality of our heart. But if this is a prayer that you would pray from your heart and you would mean it, believe according to the Word of God, He'll save you. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. My sin has separated me from you. I know that I cannot be saved any other way but through the blood of Jesus. I ask you, Lord, to save me, to take over my life, and live through me. Lord, I give you the right to determine my course and to guide me for your will and for your glory. And Father, I want to live the rest of my days worshiping and honoring and pleasing you. In Jesus' name, amen. You prayed that, and you meant it from your heart. Remember, there's no power in words of the mouth. Salvation is something that takes place in the deepest parts of a man. I would love to talk to you. If you're listening by live stream, I would love for you to send us a message through the church page and they'll get you in touch with me. I would love to connect with you and tell you exactly what it means to live and to walk in daily fellowship with God. So would you reach out to us? If you really meant that with the genuineness of your heart, you prayed that this morning, I would love to talk to you. Please reach out to us. We could tell you about the next steps of what it means to follow Christ. Maybe you're here today, you're listening today, and you uh, are exactly who I was describing a few moments ago when I said you're just, we're just so apt to live in fear and worry. We're going to sing a song in just a second that we sang last Sunday morning, and maybe you want to sing it with us. Now you know it. Maybe you listened to it last Sunday, and now you know this song, and you say, that is what I want to be true of my life. I want to genuinely say and believe that Christ will hold me fast. We're going to sing that together. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for how it speaks to us and through us. Father, here in this moment, I pray that you would work in our hearts through the word that's been preached this morning. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you for the opportunity to worship today. Use us for your glory and your honor. Help us to have a strong faith that depends on our Lord. Strengthen us, we ask it in Jesus' name.